And Joseph said, And fear not, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you thought it evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear you not, I'll nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and spake kindly unto them. Lord, please help this evening for us to not only see the effect of biblical forgiveness, but God help us to believe you about it and about your capability to take evil and mean it for good. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. This evening, before we get into Joseph's life, we are talking about forgiveness, and I want to just pull the audience. We'll pull the audience. Uh, I want to ask a question. You could just raise your hand um, if it's so. And the question is simply this. Would there be anybody in the world that would struggle with forgiveness toward you? Would there be anybody in the world that would struggle forgiving you? I'm talking about your whole life. Everything you've ever done. We'd agree, wouldn't we, that there is not anyone who ultimately doesn't need the cross. And that's about forgiveness. But we could go a step further and say there isn't anyone who doesn't themselves need to be forgiven by people who we've wronged in our lives. This becomes, I think, as I grow, increasingly my desire to have everyone that I've ever wronged forgive me. I just don't want there to be anybody that I've wronged that I do not have forgiveness from. And and I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it or focusing about it. It's not something I'm fixated on. But it matters to me. Simply because I don't want to have wronged anyone. I don't want to have done wrong to anybody. It's, it's not just about me not having someone angry at me. It bothers me when people are angry at me, unjustifiably or justifiably so. But I do not want to hurt anybody and to have anyone chained by their unforgiveness to me. The best illustration I have ever heard of unforgiveness is that under uh, that unforgiveness chains you to the person to whom you have not held forgiveness. In other words, when you there is someone that you are holding a debt of unforgiveness to, they're in your debt. In your mind, you have them manacled, and they're chained, and you're holding their chain. Now, if you can imagine, you know, the person who chains themselves to you. Now, I told you guys about when we were going to um, tubing at the teen camp this year, stopped up in Helen, Georgia, and we had a really nice time with that. And one of the uh, things that they do when they tube down the river is a lot of people, they have straps, and they tell you not more than two people, I think, are supposed to be rafted together. Well, what happens is if one person kind of gets stuck in an eddy or something like that, another person goes by, the strap will pull the second person's tube around. And then, you know, the reason I don't want everybody to just hook together and go on a long train or something is because some people just float faster than others. And you'll come up on a bunch of people that are blocking the whole river because they're all together. Well, they still do. There's nobody monitoring how many people are strapped together. But I, when we're getting ready to ride the bus up to the top of the mountain to get on the Chattahoochee River. They give you the option of getting a strap. So I thought, yeah, I'll get a strap. You never know. So I put a strap on my tube, but I didn't hook myself to anyone. I'm coming down the river, and I think there was uh, Allison and Brittany, and I think it was Emily, but uh, three of the girls, and I go by them, and Allison reaches over, grabs my strap, and goes, and connects it to them. So okay i guess i'm cruising with you guys that's nice we're coming down the river and all of a sudden they all got caught like in this eddy behind a rock everybody got jammed and so i was the furthest over so i kicked 
and I got them loose and they started to go around and start pulling against my raft and Allison reached over and released me and reconnected and left me stuck on the rock and down they went down the river. <laughs> now that was a funny thing but it is an illustration of being chained or being hooked to somebody. But the illustration I began with is the illustration of a person literally who has wronged you and you haven't forgiven them and in your mind you have you are holding them in debt and the debt is unforgiveness i will not forgive them and the question sometimes would be what could that person do to be forgiven and there might be some answers to that they could give me back the things that they took from me and then i think about forgiving them that's one right they could acknowledge what they did to me. And then I think about forgiving them. And we could just go down a list. Sometimes people have done things that you'd say, you know what, there's nothing that they could do. They shouldn't be forgiven. I hope God doesn't forgive them. They need to be chained. They need to be weighed forever with the dead. And there are some pretty awful things that people do. And, you know, if we were going to vote on it, some of us would say, okay, just keep them forever in chains. They deserve it. Uh, you know, sort of, you know, this is a lifetime crime, that sort of thing. Now, I'm not preaching this evening about how uh, there, there are things that you'll never be able to forgive until you get justice for them. Until, until wrong is righted or until uh, God's authority has given that person the consequences they deserve. Sometimes the God's authority is a government. And sometimes it's, it is legal uh, trouble, incarceration, or, or uh, you know, actually being, being charged with something that they've done to you. And you can't forgive somebody without their having those consequences because it, it just never will be right in your God-given sense of justice. God's a just God, and he gave right authority. Sometimes, though, the right authority exonerates people or is lenient on those people, and you feel as though it makes light the hurt that you've received. I'm not going into that this evening. Please understand that. But I want you to see something about forgiveness that's beneficial to all of us, and that's all I want to look at this evening in the example of Joseph. But I mentioned that chaining or that shackling, and that chaining or shackling somebody is that debt that they owe you. The thing about being chained to somebody or holding someone in chains is that you yourself are tied to them. You yourself are tied to them. In other words, if I'm not going to let go of that person, I'm not going to let them get away with that. I'm going to hold on to that. That person is chained to you, but you are chained to them. And you might be chained to some pretty awful people because of unforgiveness. It might be that you are just wherever that person goes, you have to go. Because they're going wherever they want to. You know, there are people that maybe should delete their Facebook account because they can't stop checking on that person that hurt them. And every time they see a post or something comes up, it comes back again. And they think about it again. Oh, now they're doing this. Well, now they're doing that. You're chained to that person. You're in their debt. There's a thing called blocking on Facebook. And there's a thing called telling your friends, don't talk to me about that. Mm -hmm. That'll help you with that. But if that's what you're doing, understand and know this, that's a sign of you being chained in unforgiveness to somebody. And you're in, you think that you've got them, but they've got you. And they don't even want to have you. Now think of this. There are people who hold people in debt so much so that even when the person dies, they still have not forgiven that person. Even after they're dead, they're still not forgiven. A lot of times that's a relative. A lot of times that's a spouse, or it's a, it's a mother, or a father. And that person's in the grave, and you know where you're at? You're standing over their, chain, their, their grave with a chain on you. You're chained to the grave of a dead person. No dead person is thinking about you, but you're thinking about them and they're not even here. So I want to say to you that forgiveness is harmful to you. Forgiveness is harmful to the person who cannot forgive. 
you say, well, Pastor Price, this is a complex subject, and I acknowledge that. I want to tell you, if we're going to talk about forgiveness, we need hours upon hours upon hours upon hours. Because forgiveness isn't a simple subject. But I want to show you this evening a benefit of forgiveness, and I hope it will give you a desire in your heart to be able to have what Joseph had. So let's look at his life. Would you go back to chapter um, 37? Jacob was born before, I'm sorry, not Jacob, Joseph was born before Jacob, his father, had left Laban's household. And so he was born before he ever came into the land of Canaan. If you think of Joseph in terms of Joseph's life, of his life experience, one of the things Joseph saw was the rift between his father and Esau. And he saw when they were going back, when Jacob sent his brothers ahead and all his servants and all his mate, a lot of his flocks ahead, but he kept Rachel and him some things behind. And Jacob came to Esau and he said to Esau, hey, everything, this is all yours. This is a gift for you. It was a reconciliation gift. And Esau didn't want it. He said, I've got everything. I already have everything. I don't need any of your stuff. Esau's hurt to Jacob wasn't really about stuff. It was about the fact that his father loved him and Jacob's mother loved Jacob. And these boys were really brought into a bad home situation that pitted them against each other from birth. And Jacob and Esau ended up, according to the scripture, with Jacob no longer being named liar, trickster, deceiver, but being named Israel. And Israel and Esau ended up, we see, reconciled at the end of their lives. One of the things I'll remind you about, though, is the whole time that you remain in unforgiveness, your children, your friends, the people who surround you are being taught a way. They're being taught a lifestyle, a behavior. And you are perpetuating the thing that you are struggling with onto those that are around you, particularly your children. And so there's real hope in this guy, Joseph, because frankly, we'll see it begin here in chapter 37 and down at verse 5. Joseph dreamed a dream. Now let's go ahead and read verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. I would add to verse 3 that Jacob his whole life had a spot in his heart for Joseph and Benjamin's mother, Rachel. And nothing anybody could do would make, would make Israel or Jacob think the same about them as he did about Rachel. Rachel was the girl Jacob wanted to marry. And his whole life, Rachel was Israel's sweetheart. And so that kind of started, and Laban really put a lot of pressure, bad pressure, on their relationship because of that. But verse 4, when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now we could say that Joseph is innocent in this regard. He has not done anything to his brethren, but we can also say that his brethren have been wronged. They've been wronged, and they're bitter and angry. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And, and he said, And here I pray you this dream which I dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and, stood, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves rose round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So two things that his brothers hated about it. They hated that his, that his dad loved him more than them. And they hated that he thought that God was going to have him be their ruler someday. They hated those two things. Verse 9, he dreamed yet another dream told to his brethren. And said, now I want you to notice this because this is significant. 
Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to the, to the earth? Verse 11, And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. Stop, 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 and let's learn a lesson, shall we? Why did Joseph's brethren hate him? Envy. Be because, well, envy because of the injustice that his father loved Joseph more than he loved them. They hated him because of that. They hate him because he dreamed a dream that his sheaves, they were out binding sheaves, and their sheaves bowed down and made obeisance to him. And we already read our text this evening, didn't we? We already know the ending. We read the end of the story, didn't we? What happens at the end of their lives? They bow down before Joseph. Okay? But I want us to pay attention to verse 11. Because the Bible says that when they heard what Joseph told them about his dream, it says they envied him, but it also says that his father observed the same. Now I want you just to be reminded that Joseph's dream had his father and his mother bowing to him. He said, what's this dream? We're going to bow to you? He's a little bit of a skeptic about it. But did Jacob hate Joseph for thinking that he would bow to him? Tell me why not. Parents, chime in here. Tell me why not. Because he probably believed it, that it was possible. So his dad pondered it like this may be something here. He might have believed it. But why didn't it bother him? Why didn't he resent bowing to his son? What? Because he loved him. Because he loved him. Love covers a multitude of sin. You know something? It's not the worst thing in the world if a sibling has mama's heart or daddy's heart or if there's a special bond. Is it? Jesus had three disciples that described themselves, particularly one of them as a disciple Jesus loved. And sometimes the other disciples were saying that, and Jesus just simply told them, you want to be great, be, be a servant. You know, if they loved Joseph, they'd have been happy to bow to him. Many times the source of envy and hatred is the lack of love. Many times, the source of envy and hatred is the lack of love. But we're going to see the opportunity for hatred. We have to skip a part in Genesis where we talk about Judah and then about Dinah and the sons of Joseph, the things that they did. But if you go over to chapter uh, 37 verses 29 um, you know about Joseph going to check on his brothers and they put him in a pit and they took his they took his coat of many colors and they dipped it in blood and they took that back to his dad and said looks like Joseph's looks like Joseph's coat and his dad said that is Joseph's coat and that's blood my son's dead and he wasn't the same until he found out his son was alive again grieved until that moment. But um, Reuben talked them into putting Joseph in a pit instead of killing him. And when Reuben went back to get Joseph out of the pit, we know what happened. His brethren had sold him to the Midianites. And then fast forward, the Midianites went down to Egypt and sold Joseph as a slave to Potiphar, Pharaoh's guard, Pharaoh's servant. That's verse um, 36, the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, this is chapter 37, an officer of Pharaoh's and a captain of the guard. Would you go to chapter 39? Look at verse 1. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard of the Egyptian, bought him off the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, verse 2, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master that Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, 
and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 6, and, all, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and knew not all he had, save the bread which he did eat, and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Now we're going we're gonna to note here Joseph's demeanor. When Joseph now becomes a slave, he goes from being his father's saved favorite son, who's given, in essence, a royal robe, and is given a position by his father of checking on his brothers. He has now been made a slave, dragged through the desert by the Midianites, taken down to Egypt, and he's a slave in Egypt. And I ask you, does Joseph have cause for unforgiveness? You'll nowhere find Joseph being unforgiving, though. Joseph has cause for unforgiveness. And I ask you, why do you suppose Joseph did not hate his brothers? He loved them. Because he loved them. And again, I say to you that love covers a multitude of sins. I do not mean to pry into your life, and I would not pretend to do with that which the Holy Spirit only can. But I would submit to you that it is possible that the source of your unforgiveness is lack of love. Now, I did not make that as a blanket statement. I made that as a possibility statement. I understand some circumstances which are so heinous or so terrible that have been uh, done against an individual, against individuals, that there shouldn't be forgiveness for the act because they're, first of all, is cover up or there's lack of sorrow but there's such egregious wrongdoing that if we were to apply the scripture to the situation that person ought to be put to death but let me ask you a practical question even in that scenario had that person been given the sentence of death had that person been given the sentence of death would you now be unshackled from them would you now be unchained from them and that's a telling statement or a telling answer to a question. It's telling. Again, now one of the things that I will say this evening, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, that you just have to forgive certain things. Don't take what I'm saying this evening and make me say something to, to have said something which I didn't. I'm not saying that you just have to categorically forgive everything and everyone. No, some things need to be dealt with in order for you to be able to forgive. I understand that. I recognize that. But I want to ask you the question, should you be chained to anyone? Should you have to be chained to the worst person in your life? The answer is no, you shouldn't have to. Do you think that God would say you must be chained to the worst person in your life? Now, I'm calling the chain unforgiveness. I'm not calling it a relationship. You say, Pastor, I'm out of here. You're the worst person in my life, and I'm going to unchain myself. Well, un un unforgiveness is the chain. And in some instances, separation should be necessary. But the reality of it, though, is that you don't have to be chained. You don't need to be chained, and God doesn't want you to be chained. And I think we could agree on that this evening. I'm not saying forgiveness is uncomplicated. But I am saying that the chain is not something you should have. Okay? Uh, chapter, you know, this is one of those messages that sometimes creates counsel. And if you need counsel after this message, feel free to come to me. I will not be able to probably uh, deal with you in entirety this evening, but I'd be happy to deal with whatever it is that you need to help get your unforgiveness. I promise you that this evening. I'll make that pledge to you. Uh, chapters uh, 39 verse 9 Joseph when he is turning down his master's wife said there's none greater in this house than I neither have to kept back anything from me but thee because thou art his wife how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God verse 12 she caught him by his garment saying lie with me and he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out and it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. You know what she did. She called the man of the house and said, this guy's coming. And she accused him of wrongdoing. 
Verse 20, And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. This isn't right. Joseph should not have been a slave. Joseph should not have been falsely accused, and Joseph should not be in prison. You know, there are people that are in prison, and they've convinced themselves they don't deserve to be. But they actually do. They actually do. You know, sometimes you get in trouble because you went along with something that you shouldn't have. And really, somebody else is the one who had the idea and got you in the mess. But you went along with it, and you deserve consequences. Sometimes you're not as guilty as someone else is, but you're still guilty. We play a lot of games with finding the more guilty person, don't we? And, and going after the more guilty individual. But I want to observe Joseph in prison this evening and see that he does not appear to be bitter or have unforgiveness in his heart. And I know why Joseph wasn't bitter against his brothers. But frankly, I struggle to know why he's not bitter against Potiphar. Frankly, I struggle with that. Here's why. As I understand the law at the time, Potiphar had the right to put Joseph to death. Had the right to kill him. And I just asked myself the question, why didn't he? Why didn't he? Because he probably knew his wife. I think Potiphar knew his wife was the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. I think he knew the facts. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't willing mm -hmm. to do the right thing. <clears throat> Does that make it better for Joseph? Makes it worse, doesn't it? It's not even worse, isn't it? You know I didn't do what you said I did. And you know how I served you. And you know I didn't touch your wife. And you ought to appreciate that. And this is what you do to me. And I ask you the question, why wasn't Joseph bitter, bitter with Potiphar? Why wasn't he unforgiving with Potiphar? The only answer I have, yes, Mrs. Dollins? Because he was trusting in the Lord from the dreams that he was getting from before. Okay, so you'd say he's looking down the road and he knows the end. It doesn't feel very good when you're in a dungeon. It's a good example. But I think he actually loved Potiphar. I think he loved Potiphar. You know a person who loves has a lot less trouble with unforgiveness than a person who doesn't. If you love someone you'll see less wrong. If you don't love someone, you'll see more wrong. Matter of fact, when we're unloving, it's very difficult for anyone to do right. If you're honest about it, there are some people that you just have to say, it wouldn't matter what that person does. It wouldn't matter what they do. You know, I don't think that's a very Christ-like spirit. Joseph's here is modeling Christ-like spirit. When I want to preach in the Bible individuals with whom the Scripture just doesn't mention any rebuke, doesn't say they did this and it was wrong, or it records anything, there's only a few men in the whole Bible. I'd say Job would be a guy, Daniel would be a guy, Jonathan would be a guy, and Joseph would be a guy. I'm not saying there isn't anyone else. Barnabas was a wonderful fellow I uh, as well. I could, I could list people, but it's a pretty short list. Everyone else I could say, but they did this. Joseph's one of those guys that just always seemed to do the right thing. And it makes sense that God called him to do a great thing. Are you thinking this evening? Are you paying attention? Unforgiveness will disqualify you from doing a great thing. Unforgiveness will disqualify you from doing a great thing. Conversely, forgiveness will qualify you to do a great thing. Conversely, 
forgiveness will qualify you to do a great thing. There's the help in that, isn't there? Now, go to uh, chapter 40. Go down to chapter verse 20. You remember the story of the butler, the baker, and the candlestick maker? I think it was just the butler and the baker, but uh, one of them was going to have his head lifted off. Joseph's in prison. He has such a good attitude that the keeper of the prison made him the boss. Literally, he's in prison, and he's in charge of everything and everybody. And the Bible says the keeper of the prison was like Potiphar. He didn't even know what was going on. He just trusted Joseph with everything. So Joseph becomes basically like the, the warden in place of the actual warden. He's the guy that's really running the place. So he is ministering to some important people, two of them. One of them is Pharaoh's butler. Now, a butler is Pharaoh's most trusted servant. Butler is Pharaoh's most trusted servant. He'd be the person that would be the taste tester for him. Um, but he'd be the person that if anyone wanted to betray Pharaoh, who could do the most harm. And he displeased Pharaoh, and he got put in prison to learn a lesson. The baker displeased someone and got put in prison, but they had this vision, and the baker ended up dying. And Joseph told the butler, you're going to be restored to your position. And when you are, please tell Pharaoh about me. And the Bible says that he forgot. He didn't do that. So verse 20, he came to pass the third day, which is Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership, and he again gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted them. Verse 23, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. So now Joseph's still running the prison, but he's still a prisoner. And he has to know that if the butler had just mentioned a word, to the butler's the closest person to the most powerful person in the world. And if he just said a word at the right time, I wouldn't have to be in prison anymore. And he did him a favor. He treated him well in prison. He's thinking he owes me something here, do you think? Well, look at verse 9. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And he tells about dreaming his dream. And we know about Pharaoh's dream, right? The, the seven healthy and the seven lean kind, the seven healthy ears of corn and the seven lean ears, and the interpretation of the famine that Joseph ultimately gives Pharaoh, which is that there's going to be seven years of of uh, plenty and then there's going to be seven years of want so in the seven years of plenty we need to store up and it ended up making Egypt a world superpower because when the whole world had no food the rest of Egypt did and it, it led the way for Egypt to become just enriched with the wealth of the of the entire world all the world brought their wealth to Egypt and the reason they brought their wealth to Egypt was because of Joseph. And, you know, a lot of times I've heard people even say when God had Moses lead the children of Israel, and they, and they took the, they plundered Egypt. They took, they borrowed all the gold and silver of their people they served, and people said, that's not right, you know, to take people's wealth when you leave. Well, actually, Egypt became wealthy because of Joseph, and Egypt enslaved the Israelites. And so in God's fairness and his justice, God said that's not your wealth. And he took it from them when they left. Amen. And so that's God's perspective on justice. God's a very just God. And he's always right. Alright, that's not the lesson this evening. But we know what happened and we know about Joseph's brethren coming. We know about them supposed to bring back Benjamin. And they did and then Joseph set him up by leaving his cup in Benjamin's bag and giving them all their money back the first time where they think they've committed a crime and they're afraid to come back. He, and ultimately, Benjamin gets held and Joseph then reveals himself as their brother and asks if his father's alive. And Jacob ends up coming to Egypt, really being having his hope and his joy restored to him in his last days and dying. And that brings us to our text tonight.
chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. Now, I've been preaching a long, uh, for long messages on Wednesday evenings. I'm going to warn you that you're not going to, uh, you can't look forward to this every Wednesday night. I'm going to be preaching some shorter messages in the future. So uh, come anyway. Come hear me anyway. But uh, you just have to come on time or you might miss the messages. Chapter 15, or chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was... I appreciate my wife laughing. She can tell when I'm making jokes. Uh, when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. They said, peradventure is possible. It's a possibility word. But it's a strong possibility word. In other words, a peradventure would be possible with good reason. In other words, this is what Joseph's probably going to do is hate us because of all the evil that we did to him. What evil, you ask? Well, we know specific actions like selling him into slavery, but really the action of hating him when he was their brother. That's a really evil thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's really evil. And that just encapsulates or summarizes the, the hating him for everything. They hated him for no matter what he did. And the hatred and the envy which they did against him was evil. By the way, if you're eaten up by envy and hatred this evening, sometimes that's the source of unforgiveness yourself. But it'll put you in the position where ultimately you'll be the perpetrator and the one who needs forgiveness. Envy and hate will destroy you. It'll, it'll end up in bitterness and it'll just eat you alive. And again, it'll shackle you to people. And so here they are, their fathers died, and now Joseph has been nothing but kind to them. He saved their lives. Hasn't he? He saved their lives, and he has really enriched them. And now that their dad died, and now they're calling his good evil. He's been very good to them, despite their evil to him. And now they're saying, Joseph, you're not a good guy. What would you be tempted to do if someone came to you with the nonsense they came to Joseph with? After all you've done to show that you would forgiven them. Remember him weeping and crying and falling on their necks and just saying, I just can't keep this from you anymore. I'm your brother, Joseph. How's my dad? How are you guys? I'm going to take care of you. Joseph, in his entire lifetime, was never recorded in the Scripture as having perpetrated any evil against his brothers. And when someone never does you wrong, it's really wrong to suspect them of wrongdoing. That suspicion did not come from Joseph's behavior. Where did that suspicion come from? Be careful always in suspecting people of, being, of dishonesty. Be careful of that. If you realize sometime, you know, I think everybody's a crook. You might have some notions that mean you're a crook. You know, I think every, I think he's up to no good. You might be up to no good. In other words, the thing they suspect Joseph of doing, they're guilty of. And isn't it a tragedy that up until this point, they have not resolved their unforgiveness of their father. That's what it comes down to. They still have not forgiven their father, and they have not forgiven God. Now, I say this evening, God doesn't need forgiveness. He's never done wrong. But God gave Joseph the vision. And they were angry about it. So when they're angry at Joseph, they're really angry at God. Remember what God told Samuel when the people wanted a king? They haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. And it's the same thing with Joseph. They're not angry with you, they're angry with me. And Joseph was okay, saying, you know, I guess I don't need to be I don't need to be concerned about this. I don't need a resolution. It's not against me. But look what he did. Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Now this is an important question. If you are taking notes this evening, this is important. When you hold someone in unforgiveness, you make yourself their judge instead of God. If you will not forgive someone, it is because you do not trust God to judge them. So Joseph said, if I didn't forgive you, 
I would be pretending I'm God, and I'm not. I'm not God. I'm not God, and neither are you. Sometimes it's good for us just to get that straightened out. I'm not God, and neither are you. And so let's let God be the judge. God has never let a single wrong or evil act go unjudged. Not a single evil has ever escaped God's observation. Nothing evil has ever escaped God's knowledge. And God has never allowed any evil to remain unjudged. Your unforgiveness, therefore, exhibits a lack of trust in God. Your unforgiveness exhibits a lack of trust in God. Now, I'm not this evening trying to condemn the hurt. I'm not trying to be hard on someone that's got it hard. Please understand my heart in preaching this message this evening. I want you to know the benefit of forgiveness, though. Because we all need it. We need that benefit. And we need to know what it is when we're unwilling to seek it. Ultimately, it comes down to the fact that we want to be God. And God's doing a better job of it than I could do. You'll agree about that. But will you agree that God will do a better job than you could do? You don't agree if you won't forgive. If you don't seek forgiveness, you don't agree. As Larry says, the proof's in the pudding. Verse, verse, Charlie, this is your fault. Larry would never have to stand in for <laughs> quotes that he never said. If you were here, I could quote you. <laughs> no, you are here this evening, so maybe you're innocent tonight. Forgive me, Charlie. Right. Verse 20, But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is to this day to save much people alive. And here Joseph simply says, yes, you, you're evil. You're right. I agree with you. You meant it for evil, but guess what? God meant it for good. Now a person who can forgive is a person who knows God loves them. A person who can forgive is a person that knows God loves them. And a person who knows God loves them can love others. So it gets kind of deep, doesn't it? When you start pulling back the layers, peeling the onion, to find the core of unforgiveness, it might be that you have not found yourself in the love of God. You have not discovered who you are in God's love. Friend, if you do, you'll find that location is at the cross of Jesus. And you'll find how deep forgiveness from God goes. And you'll be overwhelmed, ultimately, by the realization of God's love. And when you're overwhelmed by the realization of God's love, you will not be able to give an example for how you could not love others as God has loved you. And you will also be overawed at how that God can take evil and make it good. And now let me summarize Joseph's testimony. Joseph said, my life is wonderful. There's never been anything but good in my entire life. Everything that's ever happened to me has been good. Because of who God is. Now, friend, humanly speaking, evil is what it is. And God knows what evil is. But do not underestimate. I want to say misunderestimate. Do not underestimate God's ability that is sourced in his love for you to make evil good in your life. You just have to be honest enough to acknowledge it and see it. You know, I could go back in my life, and I could go through difficulties and hardships that I've been able to endure by God's grace, 
And I could mention evils, and I could tell you how God was good in them. And it's not because I am creative. It's because God was good in evil. God didn't cause evil, but God can take evil and he can make it good. Mm -hmm. And you know, if that's so, why could we not then seek forgiveness? Seek to forgive. Father, thank you for the lesson we learned tonight from Joseph. And I thank you for the character that he showed. I pray that this evening that you would help us with this matter of forgiveness. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now we'll take the third request. <clears throat>